learning objectives. By the end of this session, we hope that participants will be able to identify the screening test used for individuals at average risk for colon cancer, define and identify factors that increase an individual's risk for colorectal cancer, navigate through the client care pathways based on the client's personal risk, screening findings, and their screening history, describe the screening and surveillance guidelines and provide individualized future screening recommendations, discuss the impact and importance of personal and family history on colorectal cancer risk with their patients, and finally be able to use the colon check resources alongside the screening guidelines. So we have three speakers today to help us get through these objectives. Laura Coulter, Ross Stimson, and Kadira Lupitasari. Our first speaker, Laura Coulter, will provide information about Colon Check Program, including its recent changes related to patients at increased risk for colorectal cancer. Laura is the Screening Program Manager at Cancer Care Manitoba. On to you, Laura. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Um, I am honored to speak to you today on behalf of Colon Check Cancer Care Manitoba. I am disclosing that I am an employee of Cancer Care Manitoba and that the Colon Check Program had received support from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer in the form of a grant to support the increased risk project that we'll be speaking to you of today. I have no mitigating biases to disclose at this time. Sorry. And I'm just going to warn everybody in advance, I'm having computer problems. So if I do crash sometime during this uh, presentation, I'll try to loop back with another computer here and hopefully loop back in enough time. So today I'm going to be describing how Colon Check supports Manitobans in accessing colorectal cancer screening and identify the screening test used for individuals at average risk for colorectal cancer. I'm going to define how Colon Check is supporting Manitobans at increased risk of colorectal cancer. So under the banner of Cancer Care Manitoba, Colon Check operates within the prevention and screening programs, which includes Breast Check, Cervix Check, and the Prevention and Education Group. Established in 2007, we are the Provincial Colorectal Cancer Screening Program. We support Manitobans and their healthcare providers in accessing colorectal cancer screening. So starting at age 50, if you want to just next slide, thank you. So starting at age 50, Colon Check actively invites eligible Manitobans to participate in colorectal cancer screening by mailing fecal occult blood tests to their home. To be considered eligible, the individual must have an active Manitoba health card, be between the ages of 50 and 74, and have not recently participated in colorectal cancer screening, including fecal testing within the past two years or colonoscopy in the past five. If the mailed test kit is not returned within two months, Colon Check will send a reminder letter to complete the kit. As per the kit instructions, completed test kits are returned to the lab by mail, where the lab will analyze the sample and provide the test result to Colon Check. We will then communicate the test results to participants and their healthcare providers. Normal results are returned by mail, and participants having an abnormal test result will be contacted by phone to advise of their result and to indicate that the colonoscopy is required. At this time, Colon Check will make direct referral for follow-up colonoscopy and send result letters to the participant and their provider. Maintaining a routine cancer screening regimen is key for detecting the disease early, so Colon Check recalls eligible participants when they are due to repeat the test, and timing is based on their last test result, specifically two years after having a normal fecal test or in five after having a normal colonoscopy after abnormal follow-up. And to support these many initiatives, Colon Check is supported by a prevention and education team who develop uh, resources such as test instructions, informative brochures, and are available to answer any questions from the public about colorectal cancer screening. Colon Check supports healthcare providers in accessing care for their patients by maintaining a comprehensive colorectal screening database registry that contains colorectal cancer screening histories of all Manitobans 50 to 74 years of age. We develop and distribute comprehensive CRC screening guidelines that include recommendations on appropriate testing, screening, and surveillance intervals. As previously mentioned, we are fortunate to have a prevention and education group who creates helpful resources such as the colorectal polyp resource, informative brochures, and maintains a screening programs page found on the Cancer Care Manitoba website. 
Upon request from healthcare providers, the program will distribute test kits to their eligible patients and can provide colorectal cancer screening histories to help appropriately manage their patients. In addition to providing test results to patients, the program will advise healthcare providers of their patients' results and will make referral for follow-up investigation and provide information on final outcomes. And finally, the screening programs are supported by an evaluation team who perform regular data quality checks, produce endoscopist reports, and publish performance indicators to ensure a high level of program performance. So, as previously mentioned, uh, Colon Check provides test kits to eligible Manitobans. And to be considered eligible for our program, they must be within the right age group of 50 to 74 years of age. They must be due for screening, for example, having no fecal test in the past two years. Uh, they have not had a previous diagnosis of gastro related cancers, and they are at average risk for the disease. In distribution, the program makes an assumption that all eligible persons are of average risk. And broadly, we define average risk as having no personal history of colorectal cancer or precancerous polyps, inflammatory bowel disease with associated colitis, and having no significant first degree family history of colorectal cancer or advanced adenomas. The screening recommendation for this average risk cohort is a fecal test once every two years between the ages of 50 to 74. Colon Check has been distributing the Hemocult 2 Sensa fecal test since 2008. It's a sensitive and stable guaiac based fecal occult blood test, or GOFOBT, where two samples are taken from three separate stools and then analyzed for the presence of heme. Uh, the results are qualitative. Simply, the technician drops the analyzer solution on the fecal sample and watches for a color change. Blue indicates that heme exists in the sample. The result is binary. It's either positive or negative for heme, and the test is sensitive in picking it up. However, it's not spe specific to human or gastrophinics, which could cause a false positive result. And further, diet may affect the result, uh, such as significant intake of vitamin C could mask the existence of blood resulting in false negatives. So at this time, I just wanna address some upcoming changes that you may have heard. Uh, on January 19th, 2022, Shared Health and Manitoba Health Diagnostic and Surgical Backlog Task Force made the announcement that Manitoba will be transitioning to the fecal immunochemical test, otherwise known as FIT. So FIT is a newer generation fecal occult blood test, and it's the most widely accepted fecal test in Canada. With this test, a single sample is taken from one stool and analyzed for the presence of hemo, human hemoglobin. The results are quantitative, so the results are reliable and reproducible, and the test result is non-binary, so it will report the result as the amount of human hemoglobin in nanograms per milliliter. The positivity cutoff is adjusted to accommodate the health system and is supported by clinical evidence and supplier recommendation. So as a program, we're very excited by this news as this transition will benefit the healthcare of many folks in our province. Uh, we are still in the planning stages, so no implementation is, I'm not announcing anything, nothing's been announced, but until then, uh, Colon Check will continue to distribute GFOBT kits. However, later in Dr. Stimson's presentation, you will hear him make reference to your patients being recalled to fit testing, and, and this is recommendation based on what we know is our future state of the program. So I want to now shift focus to the main uh, thrust of our presentation, and that's how Colon Check is helping man support Manitobans of increased risk of colorectal cancer. In fall 2019, Colon Check submitted an expression of interest to a grant competition offered by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, also known as CPAC. The grant objective was to support quality improvement initiatives that provide value for patients, clinicians, and the healthcare system, and we were awarded the grant in late 2019. So I'm just going to pause for a minute to provide a high level definition of increased risk in relation to colorectal cancer and, and Dr. Simpson is certainly going to go into much more depth later in his presentation. Um, we consider individuals at increased risk of colorectal cancer if they have a personal history of, of CRC or precancerous polyps, inflammatory bowel disease uh, with associated colitis, or as having a suspected or confirmed diagnosis of genetic syndromes linked to CRC, such as FAP or Lynch. Uh, 
Significant first degree family history of colorectal cancer or advanced adenomas also increases a person's risk category. Generally, people at increased risk should be screened or surveyed using a colonoscopy procedure and the interval is based on the risk category and the procedural findings. So back to our project. This slide shows what we like to call around here the happy path. It's the colon check average risk screening pathway. You can see at the top that eligible Manitobans 50 to 74 years of age are sent a test kit. If their test result is normal, the program will automatically recall them to CRC screening in two years. If the test result is indeterminate, the program will send up to three test kits until we reach a, a satisfactory result of either normal or abnormal. If the test result is abnormal, the program will make direct referral to follow-up colonoscopy. If the colonoscopy is normal, the program will automatically recall them back to fecal testing in five years. If the colonoscopy is abnormal, the participant is no longer considered at average risk and ineligible to participate with the screening program. Now, after 11 years of program operations, we had robust data sets on participants having abnormal fecal test results, including personal and family health histories, procedural reports, and pathology results. This allowed us to study the screening behaviors and outcomes and ask the questions, are people completing the right colorectal cancer screening test, FOBT versus colonoscopy, according to their risk category? And are people following the recommended screening and surveillance intervals? So analysis on these data sets revealed two concerning quality care gaps in colorectal cancer screening in Manitoba. As mentioned, the program operates with the assumption of average risk, which guidelines state they should be completing an FOBT every two years. And the same guidelines indicate that the persons at increased risk would benefit from direct referral to colonoscopy, the entry age and interval dependent on the degree of increased risk. A review of participants having an abnormal result indicated that 8% had significant family history of, and would have, <clears throat> sorry, 8% of significant family history and would have benefited from direct referral to colonoscopy. Fortunately, follow-up investigation ensued due to their abnormal result, but it is a great concern to consider how many individuals with normal results did not undergo appropriate testing. Assuming a similar percentage of 8%, this may have affected upwards of 2,300 colon check participants per year. Secondly, in absence of fail-safe practices that monitor individuals at increased risk of colorectal cancer, and according to the program's average risk pathway, participants with normal follow-up post results were recalled to, F I'm sorry, I lost myself here. Um, could you click? Sorry, we just found this slide there. There we go, okay. Um, secondly, an absence of false practices that monitor individuals at increased risk. And according to the program's average risk pathway, participants with normal follow-up abnormal results are recalled to the program in five years. However, clients with abnormal colonoscopy are not recalled to the program. And in these cases, the participant and their healthcare providers are sent a closure letter that indicates that they will not be recalled by the program. Future colorectal surveillance is to be managed by either the healthcare provider or the endoscopist. Our program data indicated, however, that 43.8% of program participants did not receive the follow-up care in the recommended time interval, and 30% identified with advanced adenomas did not have up follow-up at four years or longer after the index colonoscopy. And I, I just want to pause and note here that this was uh, research up into 2018, so this was not impacted by um, the state of endoscopy right now due to, to, um, to COVID. Uh, so uh, we saw an urgent need for guidance and management of individuals at increased risk to address the caps in care. As our program recruited Manitobans with the assumption of average risk, there was risk for inappropriate screening methods or slipping through the cracks of the current healthcare system. So this project was going to attempt to address the quality gap care gaps that currently exist by providing guidelines and management of persons who are at increased risk due to their personal or family health history. The project was designed using a two-prong approach to target individuals at both ends of the system, pre-screening and post-abnormal follow-up. Our goal was to provide for a more educated population with understanding of their risk for a CRC and colon cancer screening and improved patient-centered care. 
In turn, this would benefit the healthcare system through a directed and effective use of limited resources, proper tracking of patients requiring surveillance, and improving health outcomes. The project hinges on the success of three key deliverables. Um, expansion of the colon check screening database registry so that we can collect and manage various risk factors that were input, such as personal, such that a personalized care pathway could be automated. Enhanced colorectal cancer screening pathways to include risk, risk criteria to ensure that patients are being informed and triaged accordingly. In other words, ensuring that the right people are completing the right test at the right time. The program will collect self-reported personal and family health histories from participants, which in turn will be used to identify the individual's risk category. The participants and their healthcare providers will be advised of their risk category and their screening test result with helpful information on appropriate testing. Fail-safe activities. The program will monitor persons at increased risk to ensure that they are complying with their surveillance recommendation. Letters will be sent to patients and their healthcare providers when they are due for colonoscopy to ensure that the procedures are being scheduled. And as with most health public health initiatives, an expanded CCMB prevention and education program for both healthcare providers and the public, including the implementation of web-based applications in which individuals can see what their risk, what risk they are at and what appropriate steps should be done. Okay. In support of this project, we've updated our program communications and resources, including result letters, program brochures, and result letter inserts. As mentioned, we will be collecting self-reported risk information from our participants. Seen here on the left of the slide is the reply form that is received that is returned with the completed kit. Participants will be asked to select from one of the following prompts. I have one first degree relative diagnosed with colon cancer before the age of 60. I have one first degree relative diagnosed with colon cancer at 60 years of age or older. I have two or more first degree relatives diagnosed with colon cancer at any age. I have personal history of one or more of the following conditions, IBD with associated colitis, colon cancer, FAP, or Lynch syndrome. And then finally, the prompt of I don't know or have no personal history. From this information, we can calculate and inform the participant of their likely risk category with the fecal test result. And the letter, the result letter would read something like, your FOBT result was normal, and based on the personal and family history you provided, you may be at increased risk for colorectal cancer. It's important to continue regular cancer screening, but the FOBT might not be the right test for you. Talk to your healthcare provider about colon cancer screening. Additionally, we would communicate to their healthcare provider about their test result and risk level and include screening guidelines in the uh, provider letter to support the healthcare provider in making recommendations. We will also be developing fail-safe letters to send to healthcare providers and their patients when they are to due to return to colonos col colonoscopy procedures for surveillance to ensure that appropriate intervals are maintained. And one additional deliverable that we are dangerously close to launching is our cancer prevention and screening decision aid tool. This application will be available on the prevention and screening page of the Cancer Care Manitoba website. It's a tool that you can recommend for your patients to help identify what breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening that they should complete. Through a variety of pointed questions, the output will provide your patient with a cancer screening guide that will support them in making healthcare choices and accessing appropriate care. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for sharing that information about the colon check program. We're now going to move on to our second speaker, Ross Stimson, who will be speaking about patient navigation and increased risk screening. Dr. Stimson is the medical lead for colon check at Cancer Care Manitoba, and he is also an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at the University of Manitoba. Go ahead, Dr. Stimson. Yeah, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, can you all see me there on the monitor? Yes, we okay. can. Okay, okay, very good. So in terms of uh, disclosures, I am the medical lead for Colon Check uh, Manitoba. I have no other financial interests. I am involved uh, along with uh, Laura Coulter on the CPAC project, which we are going to talk about today, and I have no other potential biases. Next slide, please. 
So as Laura has just told you, these are the considerations for we consider when we're talking about uh, colorectal cancer risk. Age is probably one of the most important factors. The older people get, the more likely they are to develop colorectal cancer. Uh, familial uh, health history, particularly as pertains to any genetic uh, syndromes or possible genetic syndromes, as well as family history of uh, colorectal cancer too. In addition, uh, personal health uh, history. And of course, when we talk about screening or surveillance, we're talking about people that are for the most part asymptomatic. Next slide, please. So in terms of personal history, again, previous diagnosis of CRC or adenomas requiring surveillance, confirmed or suspected hereditary syndromes, such as Lynch or familial polyposis. Next slide, please. Personal history of inflammatory bowel disease with associated colitis as occurs in Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And again, we're talking about increased risk due to uh, family history. Uh, we generally um, conclude that the more first degree relatives that you have, the higher you risk are at risk for colorectal uh, cancer. Uh, in particular, two or more first degree relatives pertains the highest risk for developing colorectal cancer. When we're looking at one or more first degree relatives diagnosed with colorectal cancer, uh, very many guidelines actually separate uh, into two parts. Uh, individuals that have one relative less than 60 years of age are deemed to be at higher risk than those that have a relative who develop colorectal cancer over the age of 60. Next slide, please. So here's the recommendations from CAG, Canadian Association of Gastroenterology from 2018. Recommendation for average risk is that uh, individuals undergo screening with uh, fecal local blood every two years. For one first degree relative diagnosed with colorectal cancer, uh, colonoscopy is still the standard recommendation every five to 10 years, starting at age 40 or 10 years earlier than the youngest relative's diagnosis. Uh, FIT or FOBT is uh, put in there as an option or an alternative. Uh, CAG does list this as an optional test and does not uh, designate it as the preferred test. However, going forward, we've seen that other programs in Canada, including Alberta and British Columbia are actually recommending fit in these circumstances when the individual has a first degree relative over the age of 60. They still recommend uh, colonoscopy when the individual is under the age of uh, 60. Also for advanced adenomas, a first degree relative that's documented advanced adenomas, fit or FOBT is deemed to be an equal alternative to that. And of course the recommendation when you have two or more first degree relatives for colonoscopy uh, stands firm. Uh, FIT is not recommended in that uh, circumstance. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about polyp surveillance because the concept has come up in more recent years about what we call minimal increased risk. So individuals with one to two uh, small, that is less than 10 millimeter uh, tubular adenomas are deemed to be possibly at only a slightly increased risk of colorectal cancer. In fact, studies have shown that these individuals very often may have a risk of colorectal cancer, which is actually lower than the general population. So this is very interesting. They do, however, have a slightly increased risk of uh, advanced adenomas, that is the precursors for colorectal cancer, over that of the uh, general population. In the past, all surveillance for these kind of adenomas has been done with colonoscopy. Going forward, however, with this new evidence, we see that programs such as Cancer Care Ontario or Alberta Health Services, as in the second line here, are actually recommending starting FIT screening five years after the initial colonoscopy. In 2013, Canadian Association of Gastroenterology still recommended colonoscopy every five to 10 years for these individuals. If you look at the third line here, the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force actually recommends colonoscopy in seven to 10 years. Uh, if you look at the European organizations or the British Society of Gastroenterology, they do not recommend colonoscopy in this uh, situation for surveillance. They actually recommend that uh, patients participate in a fit uh, colorectal cancer screening program. Next slide, please. So these are the guidelines that we use at Colon Check, and we've updated these recently. And with the introduction of uh, fit, all recommendations in the future will be fit instead of uh, FOBT. 
So we now recommend after a normal colonoscopy, and that includes hyperplastic polyps in the rectum or sigmoid, you return to fit testing in uh, 10 years. With one to two small, that is less than a centimeter tubular adenomas with uh, uh, low grade dysplasia, we recommend fit testing in five years with colonoscopy an option in seven to 10 years in keeping it with the US uh, guidelines. We, however, still recommend colonoscopy for uh, sessile serrated adenomas, uh, even non dysplastic ones. For advanced adenomas or in individuals with three to 10 adenomas, colonoscopy at uh, three years remains a standard surveillance uh, recommendation. Individuals with greater than 10 adenomas. Uh, have the risk of having a genetic syndrome. They should probably be assessed by genetics. And uh, we recommend screening colonoscopy or surveillance colonoscopy in one year to ensure that there's a proper clearance. And in our classification here, we've included sessile serrated adenomas with dysplasia or over greater than a centimeter, along with traditional serrated adenomas as high risk adenomas. And of course, they should have uh, colonoscopy surveillance in three years. Next slide, please. So looking at our program then, these are basically uh, the three categories of individuals that we will have after surveillance when we get the results back from colonoscopy surveillance after a positive uh, FOBT or a FIT. Our low risk category here does include those one to two adenomas, all non-dysplastic, all less than a centimeters. FIT will be an option for these individuals. Assess uh, ulcerated adenomas or polyps less than a centimeter. Recall will be five years. And for our high risk adenomas, including advanced adenomas or individuals with more than two adenomas, the recall will be three years. Next slide, please. So these are the risk considerations. These are the risk considerations in our, in our high risk project here. We take into account the uh, family history. Okay, one first degree relative of colorectal cancer, either less than age 60 or greater than uh, equal to age 60. These individuals that have a first degree relative greater than age 60, we consider to be low increased risk and are fit suitable. Two or more first degree relatives with CRC are not considered candidates for fit, but should have ongoing uh, colonoscopic uh, screening. After colonoscopy in our program, low risk adenoma individuals are fit suitable in the future for surveillance, whereas high-risk adenomas should undergo colonoscopy surveillance. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, fail-safe procedures in here, when we talk about fail-safe procedures, as uh, Laura alluded to, we're really talking about letters that advise uh, PCPs that their patients at increased risk. This information is also passed on to, uh, to patients. This gives the uh, primary care provider, uh, along with the patient, the opportunity to discuss other options apart from uh, FIT screening. When people are recalled with uh, FIT rescreening in uh, two years, even if they uh, should probably have a colonoscopic uh, screening going on there, we do provide them with a fail-safe kit. And we will continue to provide them with a fail-safe kit unless that individual does undergo colonoscopy, in which case we will not recall them for FIT screening in the future. Next slide, please. And again, post-colonoscopy uh, in our program there in terms of adenomal surveillance, uh, the first uh, principle is that we always have the PCP follow the endoscopist recommendations. We don't try to, we will not interfere in the endoscopist recommendations with that or the advice of the uh, PCP. Our only purpose here uh, in terms, particularly in terms of high-risk adenomal surveillance is to provide a reminder letter to the to PCP and to the patient that they may be due for further uh, surveillance in either a three-year period or a five-year period, depending on the pathology that is found. We do not recall these patients for FIT testing with uh, advanced adenomas or sessile serrated adenomas for FIT testing. Next slide, please. Just gonna go through some of the uh, client care uh, pathways now. Individuals that uh, enter our program and have a normal FLBT or FIT and an abnormal FLBT or FIT. Next slide, please. This is the results summary. This sort of uh, basically serves as a, a template. In individuals with a normal FOBT are fit. Okay, uh, depending on their uh, risk due to family history, which can be average or increased. 
uh, with a normal test. However, there is no follow-up test. Uh, we will recall these individuals uh, with, uh, that are average risk in two years for repeat fit testing. And individuals that are increased risk uh, where colonoscopy may be the preferred test, we do provide a letter to the primary care provider as well as to the patient suggesting that they go over the options and see whether colonoscopic screening might be more appropriate given their level of risk. We will provide uh, a fit alternate test in low risk, increased risk cases, however, and uh, provide that patient with a, with a fit test to complete. If the FOBT or fit is abnormal, uh, regardless of whether they're average or increased risk, of course, they undergo uh, colonoscopy. And again, depending on the colonoscopy findings and the uh, degree of uh, family history risk, uh, we will uh, provide future recommendations to the uh, patient and the primary care provider. Next slide, please. So this is a pathway for an individual with a normal FOPT who's deemed to be average risk. The patient undergoes testing, a result letter is generated to the uh, participant as well as to the uh, provider. That individual, of course, is recalled two years later and receives a recall fit. Next slide, please. With a normal FLBT, but an increased uh, family risk uh, history, again, that individual is supplied with a result letter along with the primary care provider. If the provider schedules a colonoscopy for that patient, whereas we would normally provide a recall reminder in two years' time, that provider uh, and the endoscopist will then follow up with the uh, patient according to those colonoscopy uh, findings. We will not reinvite this individual to the program. Next slide, please. This is a separate situation, again, with a normal FOBT and increased uh, family history risk. If the provider uh, after the normal FOBT does not schedule colonoscopy for the uh, patient, according to their uh, increased level of risk through their family history, uh, colon check two years later will remind the provider that maybe they should review the patient's family history. However, we will send this patient a fail-safe uh, screening uh, kit to complete. We will continue to do this until we determine that a colonoscopy has been done. And then again, if that has been done, we will not reinvite this patient. Next slide, please. In the case of an abnormal FOBT, again, a result letter is uh, generated. The patient will be scheduled, of course, for colonoscopy within the uh, program. Um, a fail-safe uh, screening letter will be sent. Uh, and again, the recommendations will depend on the risk level due to family history and the colonoscopic uh, findings. Next slide, please. So this is just a summary of our colonoscopy follow-up. Uh, depending on whether the colonoscopy result is normal or abnormal and the risk level is average or increase. So just to summarize then, individuals with a normal uh, colonoscopy result that are average risk will be asked to return to uh, average risk screening in 10 years using FIT. If they are increased risk level, uh, FIT may be appropriate in some of those cases with minimal increased risk, as you mentioned, in individuals with a first year relative greater than 60, or they may uh, perhaps require more intensive uh, screening with uh, colonoscopy. And again, the interval is dependent on the family history. In the case of an abnormal colonoscopy uh, that are average risk, uh, colonoscopy or FIT uh, may be appropriate uh, depending on the, uh, the uh, findings here. Uh, if it's a low risk adenoma, for example, a FIT test may be appropriate for that individual. However, with the abnormal findings in colonoscopy, which could be either low risk adenomas or high risk adenomas and a risk level which is deemed to be increased, the uh, recommendations will be dependent not only on the family history but also on the uh, colonoscopy uh, findings. In general, in terms of making recommendations, we'll select the most severe result. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stimson. Um, I'm now happy to introduce Dr. Kadira Lupitasari. So she will be walking us through some case studies to help us understand what was presented. Dr. Lupita Sari is a family physician and the medical lead at Access Norwest Community Center.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kadira Lupikasari, and I'm a family physician and medical lead at Express Norwest. This uh, presentation was pre-recorded. Dr. Lapidasari is um, out of uh, away from out of town right now, so we'll just give Kira a second to to pull it up again. Perhaps, uh, Kira, would you mind putting the slides up? And Dr. Simpson, uh, are you able to go through some of the highlights? And then we can post the video after the presentation. You want me to do this presentation? Yeah, if we have the slides available to show, are you able to, to run through the cases? Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kadira Lupikasari, and I am a family physician and medical lead at Express Norwest. Um, today, we will go through different scenarios and implement on what we have learned so far from Laura and Dr. Simpson in our day to day practice. But before we start, I have, I have some disclosures that I have no relationships with financial sponsors or supports. As for mitigating potential bias, I have none to disclose at this time. Next slide, please. Our learning objective today is to discuss the impact and importance of personal and familial history on colon cancer risk with our patients and use colon check resources to help healthcare providers in companionship with screening guidelines. Next slide, please. So how does Colon Check receive their information? Colon Check receives results directly from the lab, and also the family and personal health history is self-reported from the patient and collected in the reply form. Next slide, please. I find that it is helpful in my practice when screening for patients with increased risk of colon cancer is to ask some specific questions. First, from their personal history, do they have inflammatory bowel disease? Were they ever diagnosed or suspected of having Lynch syndrome or familial adenomatose polyposis? Or do they have a personal history of colorectal cancer? And now from their family history. Do any family members have CRC? And if yes, how many of them? And also ask um, their age of diagnosis. If they are positive in any of these, they're considered increased risk for colorectal cancer. Next slide, please. Okay, let's do some cases. So the first case is a 55-year-old female patient with normal FOVT and no risk factors. What do we do next? Next slide, please. For this case, this patient is considered an average risk, and the recommendation is she will be screened every two years from the age of 50 to 74. 
if the patient has normal FOBT, um, colon check will send a kit to her in two years, or to the providers, and the patient will see the normal result letter. Next slide, please. Now, another case is a 55-year-old female patient who has a negative FOBT, but she does have one first degree relative with colorectal cancer. What do we do next? So this patient is considered at an increased risk as she has a first degree relative with colorectal cancer. The recommendation is to do a colonoscopy every five to 10 years starting at age 40 or 10 years earlier than youngest relative's diagnosis. Or an FOBT every one to two years may be an alternative. So this patient, when we order a colonoscopy, we will get a colon check, we'll send a reminder to the provider for endoscopy to follow up. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've got a 16-year-old male who has an abnormal FOBT. And then from the history, he has two first-degree relatives with colorectal cancer. So we sent him off to for a colonoscopy, and the colonoscopy result is negative. What do we do next? Next slide. As this patient is considered an increased risk, why? Because two or more first degree relative is diagnosed with CRC. The recommendation is to do a colonoscopy every five years starting at age 40 or 10 years earlier than youngest relative's diagnosis. FOBT in this scenario is not an alternative. Colon check will send a fail-safe reminder to patient and provider in five years. Next step, please. A 61-year-old male patient has an abnormal FOBT and one first-degree relative with colorectal cancer, and he was sent for a colonoscopy. The colonoscopy came back positive which is he has a 1.2 centimeter tubular villus adenoma and focus of high grade dysplasia. So what do we do next? Okay, so adenoma with high grade dysplasia, we repeat the colonoscopy in three years and one or more tubular adenomas less than or equal to one centimeter repeat colonoscopy in three years. Again, please remember, if one or first degree relative with colorectal cancer, sorry, one or more first degree relatives with colorectal cancer, the recommendation is colonoscopy every five to 10 years starting at age 40 or 10 years earlier than youngest relative's diagnosis. An FOBT in one to two years may be an alternative. So this concludes my presentation. I will hand this back to our moderator. And then um, I guess after this, there's a Q&A session, and then we can go through the questions after. Thank you. OK, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, as Dr. Lapidasari mentioned, we are now moving on to the Q&A session. So if you have a question, please add it to the Q&A box. If we don't have time to get through them all, uh, we will provide written responses after the fact. So, so please do continue to add them. Um, I'm going to start with some of the questions that we received in advance, and then we'll move on to the Q&A box. Uh, so the first question I have, and, and this I believe is a question for Dr. Stimson, if my patient has second degree relatives who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer, can they do a fit instead of colonoscopy? Yes, certainly. Uh, having uh, one or more second degree relatives does not really increase your risk of colorectal cancer that much. And we now actually consider a history of one or more second degree relatives to be a, a minimal increased risk and suitable for average risk screening. 
Would you mind if I just added a little bit to that too? If you were to look at our published guidelines on the web page, we do indicate second degree relatives to, should be managed as an increased risk patient should be. So the fecal test every two years. You mean average risk, yep. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and another question that we received in advance, I believe you you did answer this, but perhaps Dr. Simpson, if you could clarify when it is appropriate to use FIT or FOBT testing versus colonoscopy after finding a, col a colon polyp or an adenoma. So after a positive colonoscopy. Okay. So when you talk about positive colonoscopies in terms of, of um, adenomas, first of all, we're not really talking about hyperplastic polyps unless we're talking about hyperplastic polyps that are large and usually uh, proximal to the, to the sigmoid colon. There it's quite difficult sometimes even for the pathologist to determine whether these might be sessile serrated adenomas. Um, in terms of using FIT for adenoma surveillance, um, as I've alluded to there, um, low risk adenomas, one to two tubular adenomas without high grade dysplasia that are less than a centimeter, it's, it's reasonable to use FIT in that situation. And as I stated, this has now been adopted by at least four, three of the uh, Canadian uh, screening programs. Uh, it's, it's deemed to be uh, a reasonable way to, to, to do surveillance instead of colonoscopy. This is also what the uh, British Society of Gastroenterology has, uh, has, um, promotes as well as the European Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. Overall, the risk is not great. So fit screening is, is probably the way to go in the future. I think what you're going to see in the future, I think you're going to see a lot more um, indications for fit testing rather than colonoscopy. Okay, and perhaps we'll stick on sort of a similar line and ask the question that came into the, the Q&A box, one of which was, uh, do you have, can you share thoughts on screening earlier than age 50, given the recent increased trend in earlier age groups? And perhaps that may be uh, in the context of FIT, uh, since we'll be moving towards that. Yeah, I think that, I think, I mean, the guidelines are going to be changing all the time. Certainly now the U.S. Preventative uh, Services Task Force actually recommends screening starting at age 45 in average risk individuals. Um, you, when you start screening earlier in life, you have to sort of balance the risks of, you know, and the cost to the program. It's going to cost more to include those individuals. There's going to be a, a chance of uh, false positives there. You're going to be subjecting more individuals to, uh, to colonoscopy. Uh, right now, uh, we don't recommend screening people outside the normal average risk screening uh, guidelines unless they are in one of those higher risk uh, categories. Uh, okay, and, and one more, sorry, Dr. Stimson, because it's on the same theme. Uh, so the question is, it is not unusual for me to encounter patients who have first degree relatives with polyps who have been told that they had cancer. In the absence of being able to get a hold of more precise information from the patient, how do we regard these? Yeah, that's, that's difficult information to get. So, I mean, polyps in themselves, um, there are some guidelines that actually include recommendations for uh, individuals who have family members with polyps. In general, though, we're, for the most part, really talking about advanced adenomas. These are, these are the precancerous uh, lesions. And I think it really has to be uh, documented advanced adenomas. You know, um, if you have first degree relative with a documented advanced adenoma, then a, a FIT would be a, a reasonable test to use in that, in that circumstance. I don't really think you can make much of the history of polyps. You don't know whether these are hyperplastic polyps, which are for the most part of no consequence or, or low risk adenomas, which is what mostly the findings are when we do find polyps in individuals. Okay, uh, thank you for continuing to submit the questions. We do have a few more that we will do our best to get through them all. Uh, so another one, um, and I believe this is for you again, Dr. Stimson, the difference in accuracy of the FOBT from colon check versus the tests supplied by Dynacare. Are you able to comment on that? Um, they're both FOBT tests. Um, I, to be honest, I'm having trouble remembering the name for the Dynacare one at all. We looked at it before. It, 
probably performs about the same or maybe a little bit worse than the test we use at, at colon check. Uh, overall, we were not, uh, to be honest, not particularly happy with the sensitivity of, the, uh, of our colon check test, the Hemical 2 Sensa. And uh, going forward with the FIT, of course, we're looking to close to a sensitivity of 80% for diagnosis of uh, colorectal cancer and a much better pickup for uh, advanced adenomas. And also uh, going forward as well too, uh, colon check will be the sole source of a fecal local blood test by way of the new FIT so that the, uh, that will not be available to the, uh, to the general public outside of the screening program. So it'll be the same fit available to all Manitobans. That's instead correct. Of multiple That's correct. FOBTs. Yeah. Okay. That's thank correct. you. Okay. So perhaps I will uh, move on and ask a question of Laura, if I may. Um, so the question is, whose responsibility will it be to discuss fit FOBT versus colonoscopy after having a polyp removed? Is that the the GP or the endoscopist? And if it's the GP, will CCMB have resources available to inform this discussion? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I can speak from the operation perspective, which is that colon check will be following up any letter, uh, pardon me, following up with result letters indicating as to whether they're going to be recalled back to the program or not. Um, re regarding as to whether future care, I believe it's supposed to be managed between the endoscopist and the healthcare provider. Um, I don't know if Ross, do you have any specifics you can add to that? I'm not sure that I can fully address it. Um, I mean, we're certainly going to do what we can to provide information to both the provider and to the patient to let them know what we're aware of, but. Yeah, I can, I can, I can expand on that, Laura. First of all, you know, uh, one of the principles that we, we started off was we don't want to interfere in the, in the care of a patient when recommendations have been provided to the patient and the primary care provider through the endoscopist. The first rule is to always follow the recommendations of the endoscopist. The endoscopist is familiar with the findings of the colonoscopy. There may be other factors that determine that that patient may need a shorter surveillance uh, interval. Our purpose is to provide um, information to the primary care provider about um, um, goals in terms of uh, surveillance. Uh, if the uh, surveillance intervals are missed, then we will provide a fail-safe fit if appropriate. In those cases, for example, with uh, low-risk adenomas or in individuals with, uh, with a family history of uh, colorectal uh, cancer. We will always tell the provider to follow the recommendations of the endoscopists. Uh, we have the ability to determine when colonoscopies were done and this affects our recall to the, uh, to the uh, program. But no way will we interfere with the, uh, with the uh, provision of care by the endoscopist. Thanks, Ross. And I'm just going to add to that, too. Um, as we've detailed, we're going to be sending these fail-safe letters when surveillance intervals are coming up. So if somebody was supposed to have a colonoscopy in three years, the program will be sending a letter to the patient and to their healthcare provider indicating that that time is coming. We will not be sending those letters to the tied endoscopist. It will be going to the provider. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a couple questions in the Q&A related to FIT testing. So when will FIT testing replace FOBT in Manitoba and which lab rack will the test be found on? Uh, I will just note that an RFP was posted related to FIT in late 2021. And so uh, there's a process underway to determine the lab and the test kits at the moment. And so we have no information yet to share about the timeline of FIT, uh, but hope to, and we'll certainly do another webinar at that time because it's, uh, it's an important change in the province. Um, so perhaps I will move on to um, another question that we got on a different topic. And the question is, the free press reported that as a result of COVID, patients are waiting for colonoscopy and will not be receiving these because of the wait times and resources and will instead be given a new fit test. Is it correct? Um, so perhaps I will start by saying that the project that we're undertaking uh, is meant to complement the endoscopy waitlist, but perhaps, um, Dr. Stimson, do you want to sort of describe the intention around the FIT endoscopy waitlist project and, and how we're working with the healthcare system? 
Yeah, thanks for bringing that one up. Um, first off, I just want to say that the that the post in the newspaper was incorrect. Okay, the the uh, article implied that we would uh, be taking people off the wait list and just giving them a fit test instead when they were slated for for colonoscopy. What it failed to mention is that the type of cases that may be diverted from the wait list will be those patients, the same patients we've discussed in this presentation today, individuals that are fit appropriate. So that will be, uh, the purpose will be to identify individuals that have low risk adenomas requiring surveillance or individuals that have minimal increased family history, such as those greater than age 60. Those are individuals on the wait list that could be a candidate for fit. And uh, prior to doing that, uh, patients will not just be taken off the wait list. Uh, it will be uh, discussed with them, uh, uh, appropriate uh, patients, you know, uh, candidates, uh, it will be reviewed with them. They can take a fit if they want, but no one will be forcibly removed from the wait list. Patients can still proceed with colonoscopy if they want to. Unfortunately, because of, the, uh, because of COVID, and the reduction in uh, resources, there's been a significant backlog in colonoscopy wait times, not only in Winnipeg, but throughout the uh, province. And of course, going forward into the future, uh, again, patients uh, will be offered fit uh, in those two circumstances, and this will be part of the fit requisition the form that we'll, the colon check will be implementing in the future as well, too. Hey, thank you. Um, and unfortunately, it seems that we've run out of time. Uh, so we will respond to any questions that we didn't have time to address by posting the answers online at cancercare.mb.ca, where we will also be posting a recording of this session. Uh, if you think of any questions after the webinar, of course, you can feel free to email them to screening at cancercare.mb.ca and we will add them to the list um, or respond to them as appropriate or perhaps both. So um, I would also, I would like to thank our speakers, the participants and those who ask questions. Thank you also to the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer that provided funding to help cancer care make these changes to colorectal cancer screening in Manitoba. Um, we do appreciate your feedback, so we will be sending you a short evaluation after the webinar, and when you complete the evaluation, you'll have an option to request a certificate of participation if you need that for uh, main pro credit purposes. So thank you again to everyone for participating and to the speakers um, for your time. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much.